Welcome to lesson four, building powerful multi-tier, multi-device applications using DataSnap, REST, and JSON. I'm David I, and uh, Jim will be helping me. Jim McKeith is on the line helping me with uh, questions and keeping me reminded of the time and logistics and so on. We've gone through three lessons to start building up our skills about building mobile apps. Last time, we built a mobile application accessing local files, INI files, you know, just files in our storage area, showing how to set up the deployment of files into your Android and iOS device using the IO Utils unit. And we started using our Interbase database, the master SQL uh, GDB file, uh, using IB Lite so that we could do SQL database operations locally on our mobile device. This time we're going to take the database parts out of the mobile app put them in a data snap server and talk to a remote database, in our case, Interbase running an Interbase server to create the multi-tier. And then the mobile app is going to be a very thin app that connects via data snap to the uh, middle tier and the middle tier data snap server will then connect to the database wherever it is. And that's uh, the architecture that we'll talk about and see in action today. So we're going to look at why multi-tier, talk about data snap a little, how to use Fire DAC connected to a data snap server. And then uh, that tutorial is there, and then we'll go through the, the demo that I've built up, and I will zip that up and add it to the zip file that has the slides in that document inside of it. So multi-tier lets you scale out and also distribute uh, the functionality of the database. You can have the database on your local mobile device. Better it would be to connect to an infrastructure and have a thin client connected through Wi-Fi or 4G or whatever. Also allows you to scale the application. You can put your database on a big, powerful server. You can put, uh, the, data, put the data snap server on a very fast middle tier. And in the Rad Studio roadmap, uh, we have uh, plans to support Linux server in the future so that you'd be able to take your data snap server and, and instead of running it on... Windows uh, as a as a standalone app or IIS or or Apache module, you could compile it in the future uh, and have a data snap server running on a on a Linux server somewhere, and then have the database somewhere else because FireDAC already supports connecting to remote databases as well as local databases as you saw in lesson three. So there's lots that you can do in a multi-tier system. You can keep track of which clients are connected to you. You can monitor and and uh, and decide through authentication and authorization. Pavel Glavatsky has all sorts of tutorials and videos and articles about how to use uh, HTTPS, how to use uh, authorization and authentication. So uh, I'm gonna point you to those things in the, re the resources links later. There's lots of ways to connect to a remote system to get at data. Some people in the past have used SOAP style web services or remote procedure calls or done their own TCP, HTTP, and HTTPS. The nice thing about uh, modern style is people are using REST style web services. They're using the REST sitting on top of HTTP and HTTPS to do the get, put, post, and delete, the things that you normally would need to do as part of a client connected to a database kind of operation, make some changes. Uh, you might have to live in a connected disconnect world in the mobile world where you would want to do some operations, connect to the database, bring some data down, cache it on your mobile device, be disconnected maybe because you're between towers or whatever it might be. Um, make changes, cache those changes on the local device, and then apply the updates back to the backend server through the through that middle tier uh, data snap or business logic server. In regular SOAP and REST, you sort of have to do all that yourself, but in, in the components that we give you in data snap, a lot of this is done for you. You have to write a little bit of code, but a lot of the connectivity and the formatting into JSON packets, sending them over, making remote procedure calls, all of that is, is provided for you in a set of components. So that's where data snap comes in. It's a set of components. Uh, a client side component and a, and a bunch of server side components that you can use. It's in the data snap server section of your tools component palette of uh, the tool palette in the lower right hand side. And there are many different components. You can take a look at the other ones in the doc wiki or in the help 
Uh, the ones that you'll normally see being used are the the TDS server. That's the data snap server, and it has two methods, start and stop. It also has information about uh, about the what's being created, and you can track and log information of what's going on. There's an on connect, on disconnect of a client uh, that you can hook an event and and do something, you know, put it in a log, uh, see if that client is somebody you know about client device or, or client user and, and kick them out. There's also a server class, and the server class is, is a, actually a class that you can put methods inside, and you can publish those methods through a public section so that they can be called through a remote interface. In our case, we're going to use REST and JSON to call a method, pass some parameters, get the results back, uh, we'll unpack the JSON and put it into a data set, an FD mem table, which we learned about last lesson. And, and then we can do things with it. There's a couple other properties in the server class. One is, that you'll want to pay attention to is the life cycle property. It has three options. Uh, server, which says the server's responsible for keeping track of all the methods and all the clients connected to the to the, to the data snap server in the server class. So there's one instance created per running server. Now you might have multiple data snap servers running on one machine or maybe on multiple machines as well. The second lifestyle property is session. An instance of the server class is created for you each time a client connects. And there's, there's pooling uh, options available, so you can set a number of connection pools. That way if a client connects and disconnects and then reconnects they can get back to their same session if they there's a keep alive processing where bits get sent back and forth to keep the connection and see if it's alive to a client and also uh, if a client is done and disconnects and another client comes in you can reuse a session that's already running we don't have to create another one so there's options for setting up a connection pool if you want to otherwise each client that comes in a uh, server class is created in a, in a separate uh, instance, and each and the data snap server will manage all of those server classes for you. You can have one or more server classes in your data snap server. Uh, some people might uh, create a server class for each database they talk to, or each table inside of a database they talk to. You can have different life cycles for each server class within a single data snap server as well. Uh, invocation is the third lifecycle property that says a client's going to connect to the data snap server and issue a command like do an update and then disconnect. So each invocation or command that's called from a client starts up and shuts down. So it's stateless. It doesn't know who called it, uh, used a method of a server class the last time. Uh, just instances are created uh, as new things. So if, if you're going to have a conversation where your mobile client is going to talk to a data snap server and do multiple operations over a period of time, then use session management. If you want to control and manage everything, use server lifecycle. If you're just your client applications are calling methods, passing some data, and don't care that they're going to do something else later, then use invocation. And again, you can have multiple server classes with different life cycles for different types of operations in your application. A uh, couple other, uh, the data snap REST web dispatcher get, component gets created, and that just knows how to get the REST calls in and, and dispatch the calls that you make to the methods and, and then, you know, do whatever the operations are. On the client side, there's the TDS REST connection. That's the connection component on the mobile client or desktop client that talks, that makes the connection to the data snap server. And there you specify the port and the protocol and so on. Uh, data snap rest, since rest relies on HTTP, there's two protocols you can use with data snap rest, HTTP and HTTPS, okay? And there's a wizard, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, you can also do operations on the packets that are sent back and forth. There's these things called filters that you can set up on the data snap server side. Uh, we give you two exa three example filters, two encryption filters, PC1 and RSA. 
and we use it. We have a ZLab compression. So if you've got lots of text you're sending back and forth with JSON, for example, you could use a compression uh, filter. Uh, you can also create a custom filter, and custom filters, it's the interface is just bytes in and bytes out. So when the data snap server wants to send something through the transport, uh, if filters are are there, it will run the filters bytes in bytes out, and they're chained by the filter order that you add the filters in in the filter list. When the client connects, the data snap server sees the client. If any filters are used, then the filter information is sent uh, so that the client knows about it, and the same filters uh, are used. Uh, so that if if you're using compression, for example, it's bidirectional. The client doesn't need to know about the filter. Uh, the data snap server and all of the underlying infrastructure takes care of that for you. Uh, Pavel has uh, information about filters and also in the resources. I've got links in the slides for additional filters that are out there that Daniele TT from our partner in Italy, BitTime, put together a compendium and he's got a I think it's Google code area where there's a where there's additional filters. We don't provide a strong encryption um, filters because then we'd have to do all this export licensing stuff uh, that's involved, but you can you know whatever you want to do if you've got some other en encryption algorithms, uh, AES 256, 128, whatever libraries, uh, you could have your custom filter. Uh, do those things for you. Again, bytes in, bytes out. Um, the wizard, there's a data snap wizard. You can, you can always say file new uh, Fire Monkey uh, desktop application, for example, for the server side. Um, and then drop a DSS server component, drop a server class, and so on, and build up your, your data snap server manually that way. The other way is to use the data snap wizard. And uh, it's under file, other, and you can specify project types and so on. Let's take a look at the uh, data snap wizard. So file new, other, C++ projects, data snap server. So here's this data snap REST application that's available. I'm using app method here in Red Studio. There's uh, other choices, including the data snap REST application. And so when the wizard comes up, we have four choices. Build a standalone FireMonkey application. Build a standalone console application. Build an, an IIS ISAPE dynamic link library or an Apache dynamic link module. And then just a reminder, uh, tomorrow in the skill sprint, Marco Cantu is going to talk about how to use our products to build uh, dynamic link modules that work with Apache. So I'm not going to cover that uh, today because Marco's doing it in the skill sprint tomorrow. I'm just gonna build a standalone application. Next, it's REST on HTTP. Uh, you can specify the port, whatever port you want. Um, you can test to see if that port is empty, uh, meaning nothing is there. You can also, if you've got a lot of ports already locked up, you can just click the find open port button and it'll find you a port. But my case, I, I, I sort of like 8080. Sometimes I do 8087 just the memory of the floating point coprocessor. If you want to use secure HTTPS, then you'll check this box and go to the next thing. And now you need to specify a certi certificate file. And Pavel Glavatsky have a link to a blog of his where he has the steps documented how to use OpenSSL to create a development certificate. If you want to use a production certificate, then go to VeriSign or some certificate agency and get uh, the right parts. And so if if you, whether you specify HTTPS or not, uh, the next step is, do you want authentication and authorization? That will build in a set of interfaces which will allow you to manage through username, pass rules, and a role-based attribute system who has the rights to call which of your of your methods of inside of your data snap server. Also, there's a create a couple of uh, sample uh, methods uh, and some web files. Um, one of the things the web, the rest data snap server wizard creates is it'll create a, a web page that you can use to sort of test and play with the methods inside of your data snap server. Also, data snap supports 
generating the source code interfaces for all your server methods so that you can just use your regular server, you know, regular method type calling mechanism uh, to call methods, even though they're remotely and then under the covers, it does the right thing. Uh, also, that we have the ability to generate JavaScript as part of these sample web files uh, in case you need to build a, a client uh, using HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, or maybe you, on a different device you, you, that we don't have our compilers for yet, uh, another mobile device where you might use a combination of JavaScript, HTML. So that, that all gets generated uh, for you as well. And then finally, you have the choice T-Component or T-Data Module. If you're going to use database components, you'll want us to generate a data module. And then finally, find a place uh, out on your hard drive to, uh, to put it, and then a bunch of stuff gets created. So, for example, here's a whole bunch of JavaScript uh, interfaces for all the server methods. That server functions uh, is here. So the, the two of the standard... Uh, methods that we provide are the echo string and the reverse string. Uh, and then there's function invokers and the JSON parsers and so on. So a lot of that is created. Here's a, a, a CSS for, for this a sample page, some HTML templates for your application. So that's if you check that web. If you don't need the web interface and you're not going to build a some kind of JavaScript or web interface to your data snap server, you can uncheck that part of the wizard. The other parts are the, uh, are the user interface of your application. So here's underneath here is just the start server and stop server, uh, and then thread control. All of that's under the covers. Uh, the stop just stops the, uh, terminates all threads and, and stops the server. It sets its active defaults. Here's that port. And again, there's a there's a browser interface that will uh, let you see what's going on as kind of a control panel for your data snap uh, server app. The server methods unit right now uh, doesn't have this is the a, a server method unit, but it also doubles as a data module. It doesn't have any database components in it right now. You'll see that in a moment. But it also contains uh, the in implementation of the sample method. So here's the echo string and the reverse string. And it's just returning the string you send and reversing the string and returning it as well. In the header file for the server method, here are the two declarations of these public remote methods that can be called from a data step client, from a mobile client. You put those in the public section, uh, you give them their type, their name, and, and any parameters that might be there. So you'll see that I'll add some other ones uh, into, the, into the class, which is the... Uh, the server methods class that's defined. And then finally, there's the web module unit. This is where all the components and so on that are related to um, the data snap server. Here's the DSS server, and it's got a property called auto start true. We want it to start up. It's got some events on connect, disconnect. Uh, if there's an error that takes place, so you can log and keep track of clients that are connecting to you. There's a server class. And the default it'll generate is lifecycle session, but here's these choices. Again, invocation server and session. So there's one server class that the wizard creates and it sets it to session. Uh, there's the REST web dispatcher. It knows how to get calls from a REST-based client and, uh, and see it come in. The, the pattern is uh, REST slash data snap slash and whatever the method name is that's associated. And again, you have some, some uh, events that you can have things like for authentication. If you're doing authentication, you can put code in. And Pavel's got, a, I think, 11 tutorials in his data snap labs that you can take a look at. Uh, this is a, a page producer for that, being able to test the application. And then uh, this proxy generator is the thing that generates the interface files that you use on your, on your client side. And so when we're going to build our client and we connect it to the data snap server, uh, underneath the covers, the REST connection will call the proxy generator. It'll take all of those server method uh, interfaces that are defined, and it will generate the equivalent. It'll generate it'll generate the equivalent uh, client side interfaces to make the call that allows you to easily make the calls 
uh, to your data snap server methods. And there's a metadata provider. If you're passing any data in metadata, that's there to help you as well. Uh, we can just run this application and uh, we'll compile and link and run it on, on Win32, for example. So there's the inter user interface. I can start the data snap server. If I haven't run it before, then Windows Firewall will say, do you want to allow this to access? Because I'm accessing port 8087 in this case. And then I can even open the browser. And here's this little browser interface. Uh, there, it we've had that page producer got generated that uh, that exposed the reverse string command. So if I say hello world, uh, and then there's a browser data snap client, the JavaScript underneath that uh, when I do the on click of the button, it just goes out, calls the data snap server remote method, reverse string, takes the text as a parameter, and then reverses it. And if it should reverse and reverse. Uh, there's a little interface also for finding all the different uh, methods that are exposed. Uh, these are a bunch of administration interfaces for the data snap server. And down here in my server methods one, there's those two echo string reverse string, right? That was the name of my, if we go back here to the server methods, that was the name here, T server methods one uh, is, is the name. And here's the type, T server methods one. Sorry, that's the type. So here we see T server methods one. Here's echo string. And if I type hello, let's see if that'll give me hello back. Yes, then we see down here hello uh, is the result as well. So it gives you a little test bed for your cert, for your for methods that are sending standard types. Uh, hello world. So it's a nice way to check some of the interfaces of your methods. Now, if that's returning uh, JSON and, and metadata and data, you're going to get just a bunch of uh, gobbledygook here. Um, you're going to get a bunch of data dumped out. But it's a good way to test if you have sample methods with sample types that can be embodied in uh, JSON. And then you can write other J, uh, JavaScript, and then you can write other JavaScript codes. So that's just a little about a data snap server. So. Let's stop this one and close it, and let's uh, just throw away uh, the wizard-based generated one. Um, I've got some slides here, but I'm going to go and show you the actual code in the data snap server and client project in C++. Uh, but here's where we're, you would declare something like this is out of that document, get department names, and it's going to have it its parameter is a JSON data set. And then we just uh, set our query active to false. Uh, we create a JSON data set, and then we use this FD JSON data set writer to write the metadata and data into a data set and then send return that data set so that uh, it comes over to your client and then you can pull it apart and it's all done for you under the covers. Um, Apply updates, again, we would just go and, and take any updates for different tables that we're processing on the mobile client side, and we would add those to a JSON deltas uh, apply updates, which is of type JSON, JSON deltas. And so we take all the changes, the deltas have the original values and the change values for, for the rows or data in our database. And then we would pass that back as an object as a JSON object from the client to the server. And then uh, the server side would just automatically do the work to do the apply updates for us. Uh, client code is just uh, create a JSON object. Uh, whatever the data set is, use the data set reader that reads the JSON coming over and then puts it into a data set. And then we can take that data set and put it into an FD mem table. So pretty simple, straightforward code, a little bit of code. Uh, but again, that document that's in there has it for uh, departments and employees. And uh, and then there was the Object Pascal version for apply updates. And apply updates on the client side, again, same thing. We're going to call this, this remote apply changes and pass it the JSON object, which has the deltas that are created by these delta writers that add up... Uh, the, the change data and package it up and send it over. So let's go back to our ID and let's open up the uh, group 
for the DataSnap client and server that I have. So this is a DataSnap server that I built with the wizard to start, and then I added functionality to it. So let's open up the server methods unit. And in the server methods unit, I have an FD connection component that's talking to Interbase. Under params, I've got the path to our masked SQL GDB file. I've got login prompt turned off because I, since it's a data snap server, I want it to always be already be connected or, or else I'd have to have somebody put an interface to the data snap server uh, to, uh, to say when it starts up, start up the, the database connection. So we set the connection to be active as soon as the app starts and uh, we don't need a login prompt because it's a, you know, it's a running job that's just sitting on a server somewhere. Uh, we have three queries. One is to query the customer names and that SQL statement is, we, well, we can right mouse click and bring up the query editor. It's select the customer number and company from customer. I need this in my user interface where I want to just dump out on mobile side uh, the company names and the customer number. And we can execute this and there we get the Custno and those our customers, which are these dive shops, right, for our Marine Adventures application. Now, the second query is going to query the data information for a specific customer. So here's uh, select star from customer where Custno equals colon Custno. That's a parameterized query, which we talked about last time. And so that's going to get me the customer information, the contact, the phone number, the discount rate, and things of that kind. We could test this at design time as well. I, I think there's a customer called, uh, let's see, I think it's called 1221 one, two, one might be one of those. So let's uh, do, no, that's not one of them. I can't remember what the, well, let's, oh, the value. I put the value here. Sorry. And so there's that Kauai dive shop and its address and, and so on, right? So you can actually test to make sure even a parameterized query using the fire.query editor. The third query is customer and the orders for that customer. So here it says select star from orders where Custno equals that Custno. So again, we can go in and put the value here and, uh, and execute this query and what we'll get is we'll get a list of all the orders that are currently in the system for that customer, right? The customer is the same. Here's the orders date, ship date, all the different fields, right? Amount paid, what the total is, payment type method, all of that, right? So th three queries that are in our data snap server, and then a couple other supporting the physical IB driver link, the GUI weight cursor, a storage JSON link. We need that because we're doing JSON operations. And in case we do any binary uh, operations, binary streaming for bitmaps or whatever it might be, we need a, a storage bin link there as well. So the last part on the data snap server is the, is the source code and the server methods. And in this case of the implementation, let's go look at the header file we've got um, that echo string and reverse string. So I've defined by following that document that I gave you the draft of, all I did was replace department with customer, departments with customers, and employees with orders. So you'll see the pattern all the way through the source code. So I'm defining three public methods, one that's called get customer names, so that's in the data snap server, one that's called get customer orders, and I'm gonna pass the, the customer number ID into it as a parameter, as a string, and then the apply changes, I'm, I don't have any client side code for changing anything right now in this part of the demo, but eventually when I finish it during August and give it to you, um, It'll, it'll be a full editing, changing customer information, changing order information, adding order items, and so on. So we'll want to be able to apply changes that we get from the mobile client back to the underlying databases. So we've got to apply change customer orders, for example, this taking a JSON object of the deltas, and we're going to do something with it. The implementation of the code, um, again, I'm following that, I followed that document, so guess customer name, I close the query customer names to make sure it's there's nothing going on. Then I will create a JSON data set. I'll then connect to the query for the customer names query um, in the data set writer object. 
I'll add that data set that I get the data from, and then we'll create the JSON object, and we'll just say data sets to JSON object um, to create the JSON, and we're going to return that object, which is a JSON object, uh, back to whoever on a browser client or mobile client uh, calls this method called, called get customer name. Get customer orders does the same similar thing. In this case, though, we're going to name each of the parts of the JSON with strings, customer and orders. And then we're going to call two data set writers, one for the customer query. That's the parameterized customer query. Right? We set the parameter of the customer query by the parameter that comes in, that customer ID. So set that in the param zero value. And then we'll get the customer information and we'll also add to this data set writer the customer orders, all the order information that we find. That's that second query, the parameterized query to give me all the order data for, a, for one customer. And then we'll return that JSON object uh, to the caller. And then finally, the apply customer change, uh, customer and orders, um, we get the delta, so it's a JSON object passed to us. We'll create a delta, and then we'll pull apart by using that same named string, the two parts of the JSON going over and the JSON coming back, customer and orders strings. So we can we don't have to call apply updates twice for the two chunks. We can just create a JSON, two JSON sections. Uh, and then we'll call uh, Delta's apply update, which is an interface, uh, and get the customer changes and execute the apply updates command and see if there's any errors. If there's no errors, then we're going to, oh, this should change to orders, order Delta. And then we'll, uh, we'll do the same thing in this case by... Uh, doing the apply updates command to the customer orders query. And then if we got any errors along the way, then we're going to pop up an exception with the string uh, that some error took place. Like maybe the database was corrupted or maybe someone else changed um, one of the values since the time that it was sent over to the mobile client. Maybe somebody went on with a desktop app and changed something as well so that things don't match up. And you can check all the different reconciliation or apply updates messages. Um, and you have options to either stop when it happens. You can also sort of skip a Delta update and take the next one and the next one and so on. All right. And then the web module, again, the web module is just here with uh, a bunch of helper functions for using that web uh, browser interface. So there's our DataSnap server, used this time using port 8080. So let's run it without debugging. The reason is we're also going to launch the mobile client, and so we can't have be two debugging sessions in the ID at the same time. So last thing to do is to go look at the client. The client uh, was just built by saying file new uh, mobile client C++, and that created this interface unit to which I've added some things. Uh, Data Snap Press Client, I added two buttons here. Let's look at this as if it's my Galaxy S4. Uh, I've got three FD mem tables for the customers list, the customer, and the order. And again, when I call the method to get customer names, I'm going to stash that data in the customer table. There's a couple of properties to pay attention to. Uh, cached updates or not, if you want. In this case, I'm not making any changes to the customers list, so I don't have cached updates turned on. But I might make changes to customer information. So for the customer FDMM table, I've got cached updates turned on, so it will keep track of any changes under the covers for me. And for the order, if, uh, eventually I'm going to make order changes or give you the ability, so I have cached updates turned on as well. There's one other thing on all of these FDMEM tables. There's a, um, an option for the fetch options, and there's a, a row set size down here that you can set. Somebody was asking one of the previous lessons, I think last time, uh, can you keep track of how many rows are sent over? You know, you don't want to do a query of 10,000 or a million rows at a time. So for, for FD mem table and FD query, you can set the row set size. So if I go back to my server 
methods unit and I look, for example, at the customer names, uh, it's got a fetch option set uh, to 100 as well, row set size. So you can control that. What that means is as your client application's calling saying, give me some more data, it'll give you whatever that row set size number is at a time. And then when you go to the 100 then first, like you're maybe doing a unidirectional move, scrolling through customers or orders, it'll grab another 100 and another 100 and another 100. There's also an option for fetching all uh, in addition if you truly want to get all of the data items. So on the client side, uh, I've got the uh, FDMM table and all of these things. Uh, that's where I'm caching the data locally on my client, and I, I could add a save button somewhere that would save out to JSON or XML. We talked about that last time um, as well. Uh, the last thing I need in my application is, let me just move this down and put it over here, is I've got a client module unit. The client module unit just has the DS REST connection. So the way that was created is I say file new, and I said fire monkey mobile application. Then after I do that, I say file other, and in data step server, now that I've got a project file, I have this option data snap rest client module, and I can choose that and that will implement the client interface where I point it at the data snap server uh, through the ports, and it generates a whole bunch of other things for us. For example, the classes unit. Here's the, the interfaces with some sample data for all of the server-side methods that are available. Reverse string, uh, get customer names, get customer name orders, and so on. Uh, get customer orders, all the interfaces that are in the public section, and there's those uh, the text strings that it's going to pass over in the JSON packet when I want to uh, make the calls. So that's generated as part of the 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 file new other uh, data snap rest client module. Uh, it'll ask us for the port. So when we do that, we need to make sure that our data snap server is running and reachable. And then it'll generate the source files that we need in our client to call the right things. Now, the client itself uh, just has regular uh, functions. I call get customer names. The get customer names uh, is defined uh, inside of, uh, well, let's go take a look at, the, at the, the, the form. The form has a bunch of things, but here I've got a couple of methods that I'm using guest customer names and get customer orders where I pass a customer number to it. That client module unit then has the implementations of all the things that I need. So in my code, my client code, I call get customer name. Get customer name is, is down, oh, where did I put it, is up here. So get customer names is going to create uh, is going to return a JSON object by calling the client module one. Client module one was generated by that proxy generator as a source code interface. Server methods client, and it's going to call the get customer names remote method. So here's the here's the call that I make to do that remote method call. And again, the name of that method and any parameters, in this case it has none, are going to be put into a JSON object. And then we're going to activate and make the call, get the data back. We're going to activate the FDMEM table. And then we're going to take the D JSON that comes back from the data snap server. We're going to use the data set reader to get the values. And then we're going to append that data set to our FDMEM table customer. So now the FDMEM table customers is going to have the data that came from the SQL query. Select Custno, comma company name from the customer in our data snap server, right? So the way I have a button click handler for my button, which calls get customer name and sets the 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 tab index to the first one or the customer list. The second method is get down here is get customer orders. Same sort of pattern. We're going to say that our we want to call our get customer orders remote method, passing the customer number that 
is coming from, um, is being passed to this method. And then I'm going to make the call. I'm going to use the two data set readers. The first data set reader is going to read the customer info. And then the second one is going to read the orders info. And it's going to store those in the FDMIM tables for the customer and for the orders for that customer. All right. And then uh, let's see, there's a third tab I have for setting up uh, the host name and the port I'm using. And in, in this case, I don't have username and password. I'm not doing authentication. So let's go and run this on, uh, on Android. So we've got our data. And again, the data snap server has to be running when you run that wizard for the REST connection because it needs to make a call to create the, these interface files, the, the classes unit, the client module. All right. So let's run the client on Android. And there's another thing I need to do because I'm on two different devices, not local. I need to get my IP address, which is 10.20.5.62. All right, because that's where my data snap server is running on. My mobile client is maybe on a different subnet. It may be on a completely different network. I might be running around at home, uh, running 4G out on the street or the road. So let me zoom it at, down a little so we can see the tabs at the bottom. Let's go to the settings tab. I can test this on Win32 as well. So let's just go and cut that. Let's put 10.5.62. And then we'll just save that. The save button puts that value uh, in the REST connection uh, component. And let's go back to the Customers tab. Let's click the Customer button. What's happened now, by clicking the Customer button, I called that method in my mobile client, which then packaged up the method call to my DataSnap server to get the customers list, the customer and customer numbers. That went over to the DataSnap server. DataSnap server ran the query packaged up the JSON for me, sent it back to my client. You saw my client code, pulled it apart, and then I used live bindings to just uh, get me the list of my customers, right? And then I can choose one of them and tap. I've got an on change. And then for whichever customer I choose, I get the, the order date and the order number. And then I haven't hooked up the selecting an order to see the order items and so on. Um, I can go back to customers and choose another one because now the FD mem table has the order, has the customers and orders inside of it. So it's not making any specific calls to the data snap server unless I hit the customer button again, and that will go back, make the call again. Otherwise, the rest of this is coming out of memory uh, using those underlying methods for calling just to get me the customer information and orders. That same app runs on uh, Macintosh as well. So the next step for the mobile business app is to, uh, I'm gonna give you this version of the app. I created the DataSnap server. I built the mobile client that runs on iOS and Android. I used the REST connection component and, uh, and I ran and tested it as you saw. Um, and then uh, to flesh that out some more, I've got a put a few more forms on my mobile client for like editing customer information, uh, for editing order information, and then calling the apply updates. All of that using a different database, but it's also an interface database, is in that draft Word document tutorial. The apply updates for client server using the department and employees in that one, just change department to customer and employee to order, and you will can follow the same steps. So. DataSnap framework makes it easy to create these multi-tier and secure, just say HTTPS, use encryption filters if you want. Um, you've got the ability to create uh, the DataSnap server and create clients both for desktop and for mobile. Uh, it's one set of code. The wizards just make it so easy to do. Lots of resources in, in, the, uh, in the slides, PDF or PPTX. Uh, for DataSnap, I put the Fire Deck ones in there again, just in case from last time. There's some videos on demand about Pavel in Mobile Day did C++ multi-tier with Fire Deck JSON. He built his own sample, so you can look at that replay. Um, there's also a video, the app method, June 2014, release in action, 
where Marco Cantu showed a data snap in action as well with that method. There's lots of blog information. Pavel's got his blogs and his his labs for data snap. Marco Cantu has a blog. Pavel also had notes about using OpenSSL and data snap HTTPS and how to create a development certificate. So there's lots of links there for you. Uh, next time, we're going to cover lesson five. Actually, Jim's going to cover uh, all about app tethering. Um, but there's lots to look at that follow the steps in that tutorial. Uh, you can use that. The database is, is one of the database, the employee GDB that ships uh, in Grad Studio and App Methods. So you can build that one as opposed to the Marine Adventures one that I'll give you. So you go through the steps and you can continue working. Maybe you can add a customer order form and a customer edit form uh, to the uh, business mobile app. So next time it's app tethering uh, with Jim. There's a bunch of components, again, for connecting your mobile to your desktop or mobile to mobile. And with that, Jim, Q&A. This is the, the, just to show the iOS version also works. I've got to go over here again and put in the, the you know, you pick up pretty quick, but then we start using it. It's it, always, uh, it just works. Yeah. So here's, you know, customers, go back to the customers tab, choose a different one, see the orders. And again, I'll add more functionality over time. If you build it all locally first, or you can build data snap from start is you just take all the database access you put in your desktop app and you put it in the data snap server in that the server module. And then uh, you don't have to have any of that database access stuff in your mobile client. And because of the caching and the apply updates, you can be connected, disconnected. Those FDMM tables, I could add, I'll could add a button to save locally. That way, if you crash or you shut your phone down, you'll have all the changes you've made. You come back up, load the FDMEM tables, and then continue making changes. All the deltas are saved and cached in the FDMEM tables. And then just call it once you're connected back up, hit apply updates button. It'll just work. It's it's all magic and it's all done in components. So using the append data method, will the data get added on if the customer press or the customer button got pressed a few times? Well, you saw that I had the code that closed the FDMEM table without saving it. That clears it out. How does the client module get refreshed when additional methods have been added to the server? Uh, it's in the it's in the notes in the document. You need to go back to uh, to this and uh, you go to the client module unit, the DS REST connection component. Make sure your data snap server is running. Right mouse click, generate data snap server classes. So if you've changed something on the server side, stop and start the data snap server. Bring up your client, stop your client. Uh, right mouse click on the DS REST connection, generate data step client classes, and it'll regenerate uh, all the things that you need with the changes. Type changes, parameter changes, methods. You can, again, make sure you're connected first before you call that. But, yeah, it'll regenerate. Uh, Giovanni at, uh, said, please share a C++ builder code example, uh, anonymous thread, in order to show animate indicator while the REST server response is happening. Um, I put an answer is that I'll, I'll look at adding that it's very it's it's we have an animate indicator so I could uh, do, I could absolutely do that. The other thing is that there's the there's the FD GUI X weight cursor, which allows you to put up and do whatever cursor uh, you want while it's waiting for the query to happen. You can put up a cursor. There's a default cursor, so I'll explore maybe using that component, which I've never I've just put it in there and used whatever it did. But I will, uh, I will look at that, uh, Giovanni, for the, the app that I put up versus the one that I built uh, for this lesson. But I'm going to keep adding to it and update it in Code Central uh, with the project. And you'll see a note in my blog for the, the complete project for C++ server and client side. Uh, Ronald said, where would the data snap server be hosted? Can it be hosted in the cloud? It can be hosted anywhere that you can get to through a TCP IP or HTTP request. So yes. for example, I had it on my machine, which had a different IP address than my mobile devices did. They're on two different subnets. Uh, Pavel's demo, if you look at his C++ mobile day uh, secure sessions, he did one locally, but then he had uh, a data snap server running in his Amazon cloud instance. Uh, so that had you know an elastic IP address up in Amazon. You could host it anywhere in the cloud as long as you can get to it through an HTTP request to an IP address and you have the ports open, you can, Ronald, you can put your data snap server on one or more servers. We don't have a, a sort of server broker, data snap broker like you have with, uh, with some other systems, but you could easily uh, have uh, 
you know, put a list of uh, have an interface from a, maybe a master or put into your mobile apps a list of IP addresses to try to connect to, and you could have data snap servers. Uh, we don't have a sort of a load balancer, but you could, in a sense, create your own round robin uh, data snap server broker um, load balancer kind of system. Um, but uh, so, uh, yeah, you can put data snap server anywhere that you have a Windows desktop or Windows server instance currently until we get uh, till we get the uh, Linux server support on the roadmap done. And, and then you could build a data snap server that would run on Linux instances all over the place. So Let's, another question here. Yeah. When dealing with updates, how are collisions handled if two or more clients try to update the same record? So. That's where, if you saw in the code, I say if errors when it takes the deltas and does the apply updates. Uh, there's in the deltas are the original values and the changed values. So when it the deltas come back to the data snap server, it checks to see if if something's changed in the database, and if it is, then you'll get a reconciliation error or an, an apply updates error, and then you need to do something to handle it. Like you can skip to the next. You could abort and put up a message and try to figure out what happens. Um, but, yeah, it's up to you to decide how you're going to handle collisions that might happen. You know, you could be on a mobile disconnected, and then you just left the customer site, and they they up, you updated the order, but you haven't been able to connect and call apply updates. And then as you're driving or you go to the next sales spot, uh, the customer called and 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 did something, you know change their mind or whatever so uh, but you can do that all in app you can check for update errors in the client side and the server side and write code to handle whatever it is that you need to handle uh maybe the database is down you can't connect so there's all sorts of things but collisions yeah in the delta is the original values for the change fields and the change values so under the covers fire dac and the data snap technology will check for consistency uh, otherwise it'll signal a, an apply updates error yeah, Ronald, the, the cloud instance right now, our data snap servers are Windows based currently. And yep, again, that's where the roadmap and Jim uh, put the article, the roadmap article, uh, Linux server, the whole point of doing Linux server is so that web servers, SOAP servers, data snap servers could be put on Linux uh, systems and other server side things, Apache modules and so on. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we don't have a time frame. It's a work in progress, but for now, uh, you deploy your data snap servers to Windows boxes, desktop servers, cloud instances, whatever. Okay, everyone, thanks a lot. Uh, Jim, we'll see you next week. Bye. See ya. Bye.